morning. So good to see you this Sunday morning. Welcome back to the beach. We're going to go to the beach for three weeks. We know a lot of you can't afford like us to go on a vacation. You're going to do a staycation. So we decided to provide it right here for you to enjoy, right? So tonight's big night. Kids Extreme kicks off tonight. We have over 200 preschool and kindergartners already signed up. Almost 50 middle schoolers for Kickstart. If you still haven't gotten signed up, not too late. Go to our website and get signed up. You can bring those friends. They can get registered tonight. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic week, a night of pure exhilaration and total exhaustion. So we're excited. We're going to recognize our volunteers at the end and pray over them. And we're excited about all the folks who are going to help make Kids Extreme happen. But if you have a copy of God's Word, would you go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We begin a brand new series. It's going to take us through the summer, at least through June and July. And we'll see kind of where if we go further from from uh, just these first 12 verses called the Beatitudes. You've heard these verses more than likely. Uh, these, uh, we find, though, the Beatitudes in a section of Scripture in Matthew chapter 5 through 7 that talks about the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus actually preached here in God's Word. We find him preaching this at the beginning of his ministry, and really we find perhaps the most convicting and life-changing sermon or message that has ever been preached. Now, some of you go, well, if that's the case, preacher, why don't you do what he does? Because if you read it all the way through, it takes about 10 minutes, right? That's the greatest sermon. So the greatest sermon should be about 10 minutes, right? But here's what I want you to know, that most scholars do believe that that. It is actually, we don't have all the words that Jesus spoke. It was probably about 35. We don't really know that. I'm totally making that up. But we do know that Jesus spoke more words. Some of you are going, oh, wow, that's really good, right? We know that he spoke more than these words. We find that because John's gospel tells us if they had recorded all the words that Jesus had spoke, it would have taken up volumes and volumes and volumes, but we have the main part of it. We also find kind of the Reader's Digest version that Luke records in his gospel. In Luke chapter 6, he records part of this Sermon on the Mount. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, I want you to know it doesn't teach men or women how to live to get into the kingdom of God. But instead, it teaches and shows how men and women live and how they should live inside the kingdom. In other words, it's for believers. It's for those who know Christ as Savior and Lord. He takes, Jesus takes much of the Old Testament law and brings it into the New Testament era, if you will. And he takes uh, the, the truths of God's Word in the, in the New Covenant and how they were to live and to apply the truths of God's Word to their life. And much of this was in direct contrast and really contradiction to how the religious leaders of the day had set up the law. The law had been given, but they had given multiple hundreds of ways they could obey the law and be within keeping of the law. But the reality was that God gave the law in a way they could never keep it. They knew they had to depend on the Lord in order to keep the law. The sacrificial system was designed to help when they messed up and God would forgive them. But the law was never designed to be that way. But yet the religious leaders tried to dumb it down, water it down, if you will, to a bunch of rules and regulations that they and of themselves were almost impossible to keep. And so Jesus comes to bring new light and truth to you and to me. We find here that Jesus brings incredible theological truths as he cuts to the heart of every listener then and also now if we'll take them for what Jesus intended them to be. But it wasn't just the theological truths. What was important was how they were applied and how we obey them in our everyday lives. You see, that's where the stark reality and the challenge comes the way he was calling his listeners again and now was to live in stark contrast to the ways of the culture and the world was living. And the same call is true today. So the question we need to ask yourselves is this, is how are you living these truths out in your everyday lives? Are these attitudes a part of who you are and who you are becoming every day? And so the question as we work through will also be how can we apply them to our everyday lives? Now we see Jesus, just to set the, the scene of this Sermon on the Mount, how this plays out. Jesus is teaching on a hillside in Galilee. He gathers around most likely a hillside that was very easy to gather thousands of people where they could able to be heard, where Jesus could be heard. And he begins to teach them to three different groups of people. The first were the 12 disciples, right? Those are the closest into Jesus. And he was really primarily speaking to them 
but then it kind of expands outward into other disciples, those that were not in the inner circle of Jesus, but yet were followers of Jesus. And then on the outskirts of that were the thousands of people, the crowd. Jesus is teaching these truths so that they would know how to live and follow Christ in the kingdom of God. We find these Beatitudes there And we're going to look this morning at just the first of the eight Beatitudes that we find here in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1. It says this in the scripture in Matthew 5, verse number 1. It says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountains, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, who were before you. Father, I pray this morning by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would do in this place what only you can do. Lord, there is no doubt that sometimes in our hearts and minds, and even when a preacher gets up to proclaim the word of God, that if we're not careful, we think we can do it on our own, that we can live this Christian life on our own, that you've called us, in fact, to do just that, to try harder, to be independent, to not need you that much. But Lord, the exact opposite is true. You designed us and created us to need you, to be in relationship with you. Lord, to be in a place where we are poor in spirit, a place of humility. So Lord, I pray in these moments that we gather around your word, that you would speak truth into every heart and life that is here today. God, that you would bring transformation to every heart and life. For anyone that has never understood what it means to be poor in spirit, for that is where the journey to become a follower of Jesus starts, that they would find that relationship with you today. And for the rest of us, Lord, that are living inside the kingdom, Lord, as we would embark on this journey together to see, Lord, how is it we should be living and walking as a kingdom, a citizen of the kingdom of God? Lord, we all will fall short. But Lord, may we as we fall short look to the cross and to the finished work of Jesus on our behalf and the resurrected tomb. God, would you speak through me, I pray. May I be poor in spirit that you may work and pour through my life. Lord, I'm not worthy to proclaim these words. Lord, only you, because of your righteousness and your call upon my life, allows me to stand before these So, Lord, would you move in these moments? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, here we find eight Beatitudes. Really, we find what I would call a spiritual checkup, right? We go, hopefully every year you go to get a physical checkup, and they run all kind of tests and see how you are and how you're looking and how things are and your blood work and your cholesterol and all those kinds of things that happen here. Really, Christ is giving us a spiritual checkup to see if things are healthy in our lives. And Matthew gives us this account here in Matthew chapter 5. We find the Beatitudes, though, where we find that these, these things are, these attitudes, Attitudes are progressive, right? They're not in some random order, but instead we find that each one leads to another. It builds precept upon precept. They measure our spiritual condition, if you will, and the progress that we're making in our walk with Christ to become more like Him. You see, they're not separated one from another. Instead, they're very deeply interconnected and wrap one around the other. So we see this morning, we'll begin with the idea of being poor in spirit. That reflects the right attitude we should have towards our sinful condition, which then because of that should lead us to mourn, to be meek and gentle, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be merciful, 
to be pure in heart and have a peacemaking spirit. And as believers, if we have these characteristics in our lives, and it seems very obvious from what Jesus teaches that we'll be persecuted because the life we're living is so close to Christ that it will stand in such contrast that many times it can bring persecution to our lives and also allow us to be a light unto the world. We see in each of these beatitudes there is a requirement and then there is a reward. Now, in these eight Beatitudes, the first four we find are vertical. They're in respective to our relationship with the Lord, right? The second set, verses 7 through 12, the other four are found in our horizontal relationships, how we relate to the world. I don't, I don't know about you, but sometimes in my life, I've had seasons where I have a tendency to coast, to put it in neutral, to put on cruise control Maybe you like these new self-controlled cars and we just let our lives be driven along by wherever life takes us. But instead this morning, I pray as we begin this journey this summer, and I hope that if you're out in the summer, that you'll take time, if you're on vacation, if you can't go to a church where you are, take time to tune into the live stream. If 1030 messes up the best sun and you're at the beach, then can catch it whenever it's getting you for you because it's on demand after that point. It shows live at 2 and 5 o'clock after that point. But anytime you can watch it. Gather your family. Maybe you're doing a family vacation. Grab your family. Come around and worship together as we journey through the Beatitudes. Now, I want you to see, first of all, as we dive into this idea, there is a word that appears before every one of these Beatitudes. It is the word blessed or we sang it a moment ago, blessed, depending on how you want to pronounce the word. The word blessed. It appears before each of these beatitudes, and it is a Greek word, the word makarios, that can mean really two important truths. And you might find scholars that would say on either side of this, we believe it means this, or some believe it means this. I've really taken kind of a blended approach, because I believe both are incredibly applicable to the word, what it means to be blessed. Blessed. Now, when we say the word blessed in the South, sometimes that's not really good, right? Right? You know what I'm talking about? We tell somebody, well, bless your heart, right? What does that really mean? Why are you laughing? My goodness, right? We, we say we mean that. We go to the North and they say that and they're like, what does that mean? And we know what that means. That means goodness. They just are a couple of French fries short of a Happy Meal. You know, they're just not quite getting it all. Bless their heart, right? That's not what this word means here, right? The word blessed, right? We just sung it to the Lord. We find it in Psalm 1, in Psalm 1 verse 1, it says this about blessed. Bless, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of the sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers. Blessed is that man. What does that word mean, blessed? We sing to the Lord, blessed be your name. What does that word actually mean? Well, the word blessed means this. It means to be approved or to find approval. To approve or to find approval. So in essence, we say to the Lord, though he doesn't need our approval, right? He is God Almighty. He does not need the approval of any man, nor does he seek the approval of any man. But it means that I am saying, Lord, I love you. I adore you. I approve of who you are. Right? I'm recognizing that with my life. I'm proving with my life that you are blessed. That we bless who you are. But for us as human beings, from God putting it towards us, the idea that you, as a follower of Jesus, listen to this, are approved by God. You ever seen those stamps before they used to have back in the day? We don't have them now since we got all these computers. But back in the day, there would be a, a, an approval or a rejection stamp. Big old red stamp, it would seem like to me, and they would find great, great joy in stamping that rejection letter. Can I just tell you something, folks? Some of you have bought into the lie in your life that you are rejected, that you are worthless, that you will amount to nothing. Somebody told you that in your life. But by God's grace, if you're a follower of Jesus, listen, God says you are blessed. You are approved by God. Yeah, but preacher, you don't know what I've done or where I've been or what's been going on in my life. You're right, I don't. But God says you are approved. And there's much to say about where we are and where we're living and how we're living. We're going to look at that. But it starts here. But not only am I approved, because I am approved, the second 
uh, meaning of this word means this. It means this contented, blissful, privileged, joyful, over-the-top happiness. Now, oh, this word is power-packed, this word blessed. Now, here's how I define the word when it says blessed. Here's what I mean by this. I, I put, kind of put it. And I, I put it this way. Because we know we are approved by God, right? Because we know we are approved by God, and we are, we just said it, right? We're blessed. It's a pronouncement of who we are. And thus, we can live a life of total contentment and joy that isn't based on our circumstances or our feelings. So think of this for a moment. Let's look at it this way. Blessed is the man who is approved by God and is in joy that is not contingent upon circumstances or life. Blessed is that man. Joyful is that man. Approved is that man who is poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This blessed, this joy is, is described as secret within itself. That it is a joy that is serene. It is untouchable. It is a self-contained joy which is completely independent of all the changes and the chances in life. This is the kind of joy that God desires that each of us would have. A state of joy and well-being that is not dependent on our physical or our temporal circumstances. Obviously, this is for the child of God. John MacArthur says it this way, to be blessed is not superficial feeling of well-being based on circumstances, but a deep supernatural experience of contentedness based on the fact that one's life is right with God. Blessedness is based on objective reality realized in the miracle of transformation to a new and divine nature. Now, we know this goes in direct opposition to what the world would say to us, right? The world would say, happy are those who are rich, who are noble, successful, famous, macho, glamorous, popular, aggressive, on top. Whatever word you want to use there. But that goes, the scriptural definition goes totally opposite of that. William Barclay said it this way, human happiness is something which is dependent on the chances and changes of life. Something which may give and which life may also destroy. The Christian blessedness is completely untouchable and unassailable. The Christian has the serene and untouchable joy which comes from walking forever in the company and in the presence of Jesus. Jesus told his disciples in John 16, No one will take your joy away from you. That good old song, some of us learned when we were little bitty kids. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, right? It's in our hearts. Happiness is based off our circumstances. Joy is found deep inside of us. Now listen, that does not mean that when we come up against difficult circumstances, sometimes Christians miss this point, that when I face with a horrible situation, that I'm doing herkies for Jesus in a toe touch, and I'm saying, woohoo, man, this is awesome. Bring on some more, God. That's not what Job does, right? In the Old Testament, Job is not celebrating all the things that are happening. He's mourning. It's a difficult moment. But in the middle of that moment, Job says, Lord, though you slay me, I will worship you. That is joy. That I can trust in the middle of the most darkest moments and the greatest of moments. And folks, that's what it means to be blessed. You're approved, and because I'm approved, I can have the joy not dependent on anything else in this world, but except on Jesus. And as I'm blessed, I'm called to be poor in spirit. You see, that's our attitude we're looking at this morning, the word humility. The word humility. I want us to talk about what it means to be poor in spirit. Now, and this is the very first and most important step, folks. So let me just tell you, if you don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, this is the starting spot. This is the place where every person must come to a realization that you and I must be poor in spirit. It begins the process of the rest of this Sermon on the Mount and these Beatitudes. We cannot apply these truths to our lives on our own. We cannot make these precepts 
practiced in our lives without depending and resting in the Holy Spirit of God. It is here we start. It is here we empty ourselves and say, Oh Lord, fill me up with you. But let's talk about what poor in spirit. We don't use that word very often in our English language. What does poor in spirit mean? Well, let me tell you first of all what it's not. It is not here meaning financial destitution or material poverty. It's not some conviction that I have no value at all, that I have no self-worth, or that I'm insignificant. It doesn't mean that I'm called to refute or to refer that I have a poor quality of faith. It doesn't mean that I'm thinking I'm a zero or that I'm shy or lacking in vitality or courage or that I'm spiritually anemic or gutless. It also doesn't mean, have you ever met that person that will tell you, listen, I just need you to know I'm the most humble person I've ever met. Now think about that for a moment. You're not very humble if you're the most humble person you've ever met, right? False humility. That's not what this means here to be poor in spirit. What it does mean is this. It means spiritually bankrupt. To understand that without Christ Jesus, you and I are spiritually bankrupt. We are destitute. It is the word poor. The word poor. In the Old Testament, we see the evolution of this word that did originally mean poor, meaning that I am financially poor, but it began to mean something different in the Old Testament in relation in particular to the Jewish nation as they went into exile and they were desperate and hungry for God. They wanted to see God move in a humble dependence on the Lord. Look at these scriptures, kind of how this progressed throughout the scriptures. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 12. But I will leave among you a humble and a lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. In Psalm verse 34 verse 5, they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were never ashamed. Maybe it's verse 6. Psalm, I may, I, I might pick the wrong verse right there. Isn't that good? Psalm 34, verse 6. I don't know if you can find that one that fast, Matt and Michael. We'll see how fast you are. I had, I had in my notes, I gave them, I gave them 34, verse 65. There is no verse 65 in there. Hard to find that, isn't it? 34, verse 6, it must be. Yep. The poor man. Listen to what it says. Look at him. Man, Michael Blanton, you are good, friend. You are so good. I didn't know any better. Man, I need to be quiet. All right, so this poor man cried. I was about to say something about a baseball game, but I need to stop. So this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and what? And saved him out of all his troubles. The poor man cried out, to, and the Lord heard him. He was desperate for the Lord. Isaiah 41, verse 17 and 18, The afflicted and needy are seeking water, but there is none. Their tongue is parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them myself. This word afflicted and needy means poor. The next one here in Isaiah 57, I think it's 57 and 15, For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and a holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit. That's who God says he lives with, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. 66 verse 1 and 2, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where there is a house you can build for me, where is a place that I can rest? Look here, but to this one I will look to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Jesus speaks and quotes from Isaiah and he says here when he's talking to his disciples about why he came, the spirit of the Lord is on me to preach what? Good news to the what? The poor. Now in this case, there were people that were poor he preached to, but he's talking about the poor in Spirit. I love this idea of what it means to be poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. Now, there were two words in the Greek that meant poor. The first word is with somebody, in example, the widow with two mites. You remember the story Jesus tells of her coming to bring an offering, and she has two coins, she places them in there, and the Bible would say she was poor. But she had some means. That's not the word that is used here in the Greek. Instead, it's another word that means destitute. It means a beggar. It means to cringe backward. In other words, a beggar of the day would be on their knees and someone would approach them and they would cringe backward. That's what a beggar did in that day. A beggar was dependent on someone else to provide everything that they possibly could need. We're talking about, and I preached about it not long ago, about the rich man in Lazarus. Lazarus had nothing. He was dependent on the breadcrumbs to even survive. 
These beggars could not survive without someone else's intervention. Now think about that picture for a moment of what it means to be poor in spirit, a beggar. Now that's not the most impressive thing to put on your resume, is it? Right? Go, go to your resume and put a job on there and put on there a beggar. Right? A, we would call it today a panhandler. Someone that is destitute, has nothing. But that's what Jesus says it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. To be poor in spirit. To what? To realize that we are totally spiritually destitute and bankrupt and that we must be completely dependable on the Lord. Completely dependent upon the Lord that we are powerless without Him. That we are, we are confessing that we are unworthy to be in God's presence. That we come empty-handed before a holy and a righteous God and realize that we are desperately dependent upon Him. It is an absence of pride that we are nothing and have nothing in the presence of God. I love how these two translations kind of put it. One is a commentator, one's another translation. It says this verse this way. Blessed are those, uh, blessed are those, I don't know if you have that on there, but let me read it to you in case you don't have those, those phrases. It says, blessed are those who realize that they have nothing within themselves to commend them to God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Another one says it this way, oh, the bliss of the man who has realized his utter helplessness and who has put his whole trust in God, for thus alone he can render to God that perfect obedience which will make him a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he's thinking it, saying it this way, there's a sense of absolute poverty of our spirit. That we're solely dependent on the Lord. No confidence in my successes or in my achievements that will get me anywhere, that will earn me anything with the Lord. Sometimes we forget how poor we really were. You remember when you first got married, couples, right? Some of you got married and you had absolutely nothing. If it were not for a wedding shower, you wouldn't have dishes. You wouldn't have had a cup to drink out of. You had nothing. And then things got better. And then you had children and you got poor again. <laughs> right? And we, were, we would talk about those moments. Oh, do you remember when? Folks, do you know what we need to be as believers in Jesus Christ? Is oh, do you remember when? I remember when I was, I remembered I was poor in spirit, that I was bankrupt spiritually, that I was destitute without the Lord. You see, God doesn't want us to live there in that one moment, but instead he wants us to stay there, to live in that moment, to constantly be aware that I am to be poor in spirit. If we're not careful, the longer we're a believer, the more we think we deserve God's love, and we think we're doing pretty good and we're pretty religious. And you know what that makes us? This is, we think we read this story and go, well, that's not me. You remember the story in Luke chapter 18, the story of the Pharisee and what's called the publican or the tax collector? They go to the temple and pray, and Jesus quotes their prayers in the temple. The Pharisee says, Lord, thank you that I'm not like this poor, wretched sinner, that I fast and I pray and I give my alms to the poor. And the tax collector comes and prays before the Lord and says, Lord. And he beats his, his hands on his chest and he says, Lord, I am a vile sinner. Thank you, God, that you hear my prayer. Folks, if we're not careful, one of the enemy's most subtle and vicious weapons is to make us think that we're religious and we're good. And we deserve God's love somehow. But that goes completely against what God teaches here. You see, pride has no part in the kingdom of God. I love this as a short person a lot. The door into his kingdom is low. One who stands tall can never go through it. We must realize how empty that we are. How unworthy we are. You see, we can't live until we admit first, watch this, that we're dead. Now, how do we become poor in spirit? Quickly, four things quickly. Number one, we must see ourselves for who we really are. 
We must see ourselves for who we really are, not who we want people to see that we are, not people that we impress so that they like who we are, but instead we honestly take a look in the mirror. James says that we look in the mirror and we see ourselves for who we are, and we don't walk away unchanged or unfazed, but instead we see ourselves in the lens of God's Word. We compare ourselves not to people around us, but we compare ourselves to the Lord, to the holiness of God. And it's when I look at the holiness of God that I realize what a wretched sinner I am in comparison to His perfection and holiness and righteousness. My response should be nothing but humility. To turn my eyes off of myself and look to the Lord. And it's when I do that, I realize how poor in spirit I should be. Secondly, we must hear the clear call to be humble. We must hear the clear call to be humble. Several places throughout Scripture is reminded of this. In Matthew chapter 4, before the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, says this. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, oh, I love when these verses I write down and I don't write them down right. It's not the right one, but it talks about being humble. Let's go to the next one, James 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. 1 Peter 5, verse 5. You younger men, men likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, just for a quick second, I want you to look at your neighbor, your wife, or your kids, and look at each other, and just just quickly, we don't have long, because I'm out of time almost, look at them and say, just want you to know and remind you, you're a sinner. Go ahead and look at them. It'll be fun for some of you. Go ahead. Good. Tell them how you're a sinner, right? Now, some of you want to add some words to it. Stop right there. Some of you are going too far. I know it. This morning, you were a sinner. You caused me to sin before I got to church, Right? Sometimes Sundays are a great time to remind ourselves of what sinners we really are, right? We were coming to get here on time, but we didn't make it because you and you, right? That's not what I want you to do, but I want you to remember. Try to talk somebody about the gospel and tell them, by the way, the Bible says you're a sinner. Nobody wants to think they're a sinner. Nobody wants to think they're the enemy of God. The world would say anything but that. But what, where it must start is we must understand the call to be humble. Thirdly, we must choose to daily deny ourselves and die to ourselves. We must choose daily to deny and die to ourselves. Look at these commands of Jesus, to deny and to die. Look what it says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Galatians 2.20, and I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not I, but Christ that lives within me. And the life that I live by, uh, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I had been crucified with Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, the last part of this verse, look at this verse right here. I die daily. When's the last time that you got up and you had your quiet time this morning, in the morning time before you started your day, and the day started with this, I must die to myself today. To my wishes, to my wants, to my desires, to my religion, to my perfection, to my independence And I die to myself and deny what I want and say, Lord, whatever you want. Folks, that's what it means to be blessed. Lastly, we must must continually and consistently pursue humility and pride. Kent Hughes in his commentary says this, Someday if history is allowed to continue, a a perceptive artist may sculpt a 20th century person with arms wrapped around himself in a loving embrace, kissing himself in the mirror. I would add to the 21st century, what would it be? A selfie. Because why? We've taught this generation that it's all about them. 
Who thought of a button to turn the camera in reverse? Most of us don't want to be in any pictures. But they turned the camera back on us so we could display ourselves. Folks, some of us need a camera flip today. You need to flip your camera and get it off yourself and back on the Lord. See, dear friend, it's not about you and it's not about me. And if you want to live a blessed life, a life that is marked by approval of God, that is a joy that is marked by not worried about circumstances or change in life, then we'll come to the cross. We must continually and consistently pursue humility and pride. Look at this last thing quickly. Revelation chapter, 13, uh, chapter 3, verse 17. In Laodicea, listen to what it says. Listen to what the church said there. They, 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 were, they were bragging on them, but then listen, look what happened. Because you say, I am rich and I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Let me be a shepherd for just a moment. Some of us in many churches are full of people who've become wealthy and need nothing. And we don't even know how wretched and miserable and poor we've become. Because our culture says you're good. But the problem is it's an American version of a Christianity. It's not what's in the Bible. You see, we need to be at the place, the writer of the great hymn of old, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. August, Augustus M. Toplady wrote this great hymn. And in one of the verses he says this. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul a fountain, to, or foul I to the fountain fly, was me Savior, or I We see the attitude. We close with our hope. And here it is. The kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the spiritually bankrupt, those that understand and know that without Christ they are nothing. They are nothing. And when we realize that and when we stay there, it is then that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Both here and now, the riches of his kingdom, God says, will become yours and mine for those who are followers of Jesus. We trade our brokenness for the riches that are found in Christ Jesus. And I mean riches. I don't mean money. I mean the wealth of knowing Christ as Savior and Lord. It is in that prayer of the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That Christ would reign in us and as we, he reigns in us then we in turn are able to reign with him. What a promise. So where are you this morning? Blessed. Those that are approved by God that have because of that a joy that is un completely shakable by circumstances or changes in life. There's joy. Would you pray with me this morning? With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning as we just stop and take a moment to think about and to respond to what God has spoken into our lives this morning. I just want to ask you a few questions for you to think through as we or in an attitude of prayer. Today, for some of you, you may realize for the very first time, you are spiritually bankrupt. That you have no hope today without Jesus Christ. Maybe someone invited you today. Maybe you're somebody's one, as we've been talking about over these last 
five and six Sundays together. That you need Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. And how you know you're spiritually bankrupt, you admit to God you're a sinner and ask me to forgive you of all of your sins. That you have nothing to give to Jesus, only your life. And to confess to him your sins. The second part of that is to believe, the B, to believe that Jesus is God's only son who loved you enough to came and come and live and die for you so that you could experience the kingdom of heaven both here and in eternity to come. And believe it in such a way that you confess Jesus as your Savior and commit your life to him as Lord. How I urge you, friend, to do that today. Right where you sit in this building, right where you may be sitting at home watching online today, wherever you are, that you would reach out to the Lord this morning. He's waiting. For others of you, you need a part of the body of believers. You know Christ is saving Lord, but you're a spiritual orphan. You're not a part of a family of God or not actively connected. I want to encourage you and plead with you. Would you come this morning and say, yes, I want to be a part of this body of believers. God's told us this is where we need to be. For others, you're not connected to a life group. You're not doing life together with others, and you need to be. And I want to encourage you. I know it's summertime, and a lot of, a lot of us think to ourselves, well, I'll, I'll pick back up next July or August whenever we start back. I want to encourage you. Start back next Sunday. Don't wait. Be connected. Be connected. For some, you need to be reminded again that you are approved by God. The world has beat you to death this week, and you think, I am nothing But you remember that though you are nothing, Christ says because of who he is that you are approved by God. Maybe you need to, as a believer, need to be reminded of who you are or who you were and declare once again that spiritual bankruptcy before the Lord and say, Lord, without you, I'm nothing. Forgive me for trying to live on my own. Maybe because of some things that are happening in your life, you've forgotten how blessed you are. Dear friend, would you hear that definition and realize how blessed today you are in Christ Jesus? And maybe lastly, for some of us, we're, we've become complacent like the believers in Laodicea. And we're trying to do things on our own. And Christ says this morning, I invite you to come, as he did those Laodiceans, to come and let me fill you with my spirit. Father, I pray in these moments of invitation and response that we would respond to the truth of your word whether it's to find Christ as Savior and Lord, join this church family, life groups, Lord, to, to, to give our lives to ministry. If you've called us to give and surrender our hearts and lives to ministry, to be a pastor or a missionary or other things, Lord, that you would call us to that. Lord, for others, to do business with what we've heard this morning specifically or maybe something completely unconnected, that, God, that you would work in these moments. Lord, as we declare the truth of your word this morning, that we will build our lives on you, the solid rock, and foundation of Jesus. Move in these moments, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.